I still can't tell if this is idiotic or ingenious, Sheeda said, once the door had closed behind them. James looked at her questioningly. She had bent over a few steps into the room and picked up a small object off the ground that James had proactively kicked into the room earlier. James didn't need to see it to know what it was. She was currently eyeing one of the halves of a broken toothpick that he had earlier stuck in the gap of his cabin door. When the door was opened, it fell to the ground, clearly signalling what happened to anyone in the know. A very old trick he had known since childhood, as it, or variants of it, had often been shown in all kinds of media on Earth, but he couldn't deny its effectiveness. Reminding Sheeta to be careful what she said out loud, he pointed at his wrist, while walking past her towards the closet, in order to drop off his equipment and get a fresh change of clothes. It is time tested, he replied, while distractedly rummaging through some drawers full of shirts and boxes, picking out whatever stood out to him. When he had put together everything he needed, he turned to the bathroom, crossing the cabin with quick steps. All right, call the others and get comfortable. I'll be right back, he said, as Sheeta had already thrown herself onto his neatly made bed, the sheets bouncing up and crumpling for the impact. Have fun, she impishly answered while rolling over the fabric, filling the room with a rustling sound. He chuckled and closed the door behind himself, playfully calling out, and no peeking, before it shut completely. If she'd have had a reaction to that, it didn't make it through the door, so he would have to imagine it. With her in his room, it was the first time that it actually sank in that his bathroom couldn't be locked. As much as he loved working on the ship, the design decisions made while building it, that to him seemed impractical at the best of times, just kept piling up over time. Then again, there was no use in fussing over it now. So he quickly undressed and got into the sanitary unit before he could think about it any harder. I really need a haircut, he instead thought, as the water pressed strands of wet hair into his face. By now it had grown almost as long, as he had ever had it back in his early teens. He also needed to shave, badly. One of these was way easier to fix than the other, so after he had sufficiently washed and dried himself off, he stepped over to his cabinet, taking out his electrical razor. With it, he trimmed the hairs in his face down to a short stubble over the sink, which was complicated a bit by the fact that his only mirror hung a few steps away over a counter. But after taking some time, he felt that he had managed well enough without seeing his face, while regarding himself in said mirror. At least, the shave appeared to be even. He turned his head and shifted his lips, trying to consider every possible angle he might have missed. Everything seemed fine. His hair, on the other hand, was still just grown out enough that it looked awkward, and he could do nothing about it. He had seen people make the mistake of trying to cut their own hair without experience, too many times to repeat it himself. For now, long hair it was, he thought, carrying through it with his hands. Soon, he would likely have to get into the habit of tying it back. He made eye contact with his own dark eyes for a moment. He had always disliked them, dark brown and monotonous, with a black ring encircling them. In short, boring. It didn't help much that he had inherited them from his father. Then again, maybe he would dislike striking hazel eyes just as much had he inherited them from his mother, like he had invented her raven hair. He shook his head, trying to brush away the train of thought. Now wasn't the time for this. Instead, walked over to get something else out of his cabinet. It was a medical lotion, which he routinely rubbed on the many scars and other traces left on him by years of voluntary abuse he had put his own body through. While applying it, he inwardly lamented for a moment, about how he used to think that things would get easier once he had finally made it to his current position. But apparently a calm, easy life just wasn't in the cards for him. Maybe he only had himself to blame for that, sticking his nose into everything. Then again, if a good life meant keeping his head down and his eyes and mouth shut, he didn't want it anyway. After he was done with the lotion, he also applied deodorant and finally put on the fresh clothes, concealing the testimonies of his past. With a comb in hand, he then got to work, making sure he looked somewhat presentable, despite his suboptimal hair situation. Having shaved definitely helped with that. He didn't really do it for anyone but himself, seeing as none of his acquaintances would be able to tell the difference between a tidy and an untidy appearance of his. But he felt it was important to keep up certain standards, even if it was just for his own conscience. Finally satisfied, 
are no longer looking like either a homeless person or his lab mates the weekend before a deadline. He put everything back where it belonged and picked his dirty clothes off the floor. Despite the bathroom's AC working overtime to refresh the warm, damp air his shower had left behind, James still felt relatively a cold breeze wash over him as he opened the door once more and stepped back into his cabin. He looked around. Already present and accounted for were himself, Shida and Curie, just one missing. James greeted Curie with a wave while bringing his old clothes over to the laundry shed. But Curie was a lot more interested in the technical setup that James had prepared for today, before he had met Shida for their workout session. Maybe calling it a setup was glorifying it a bit. It was just his laptop connected to a small projector, which he had cheaply bought from the internet for the specific purpose of bringing it along for entertainment, as well as some better speakers. Today was movie night. At least that was the facade they were putting on. Even though James was sure that they had taken out the camera surveilling the room, they still had to worry about being listened to since they couldn't just leave their assistants outside without it being more than just a bit suspicious. So his dear observers would get to listen to him introducing his intergalactic colleagues to some earthly entertainment, while he and his co-conspirators plan the next steps behind the scenes. Curie didn't seem to care much about the setup's basicness, inspecting it in depth and bringing their face up close and personal with the cords, connecting the different devices. Their red eyes seemed to be intent on taking in every single detail about the different components. James stepped next to them for a second, futilely trying to see what it was they saw in the apparatus that fascinated them so. In the end, his brain was just wide differently from theirs, though seen only cores and plastic shells. But since they were clearly having fun with it, he stepped away, leaving them to it, while he would try to make conversation with somebody who was a bit less distracted. He walked over to his now messy bed, in which Shida was still lounging around, and carelessly let himself fall backwards onto it, his head landing only centimetres from hers with a poof noise. Apparently she had gotten up at least once while he had been in the shower because her assistant was no longer strapped to her arm, as he now saw. Instead she had laid it on his desk right next to his, and just like he did with his, she had made sure that the integrated camera was facing the wall, and only the wall. Tilting his head back, pushing his hair into the mattress and his chest up in the process, he looked at Sheeta's face, which, of course, was now upside down from his point of view. Hey, how's it going? He asked with a deadpan expression, while holding that ridiculous pose. Sheeta folded her arms under her head and rested her chin on it while she answered, Pretty good overall, but some weird guy is trying to talk to me. Hmm, sounds serious. Maybe you should tell security, James continued, still refusing to change his posture, even though by now his head and neck started to ache under the unnatural stress. Shida made a contemplative sound and let her head roll onto her cheek before she responded, Maybe, but I want to see how things pan out first. As much as he wanted to, James couldn't hold the silly position any longer and was forced to roll onto his stomach in order to keep eye contact with Shida. Other than her, he propped his now sore head up only on his right arm, leaving his left hand free to gesture with. He now also noticed that, with his little jest, he had absolutely ruined all the work he had early put into bringing his hair into an acceptable shape. Oh well, at least he had tried. Keeping the conversation going, he said, Are you sure about that? That might be a bad decision. At least that was what his mouth said. His arm, on the other hand, signed something different. Would you tell me why we scared the guy half to death now? Sheeta smirked, also freeing one of her arms. James could also see her tail start to sway around. Perhaps, but in the end, it is my call, she said out loud, and to make him question himself, once he does, he'll make mistakes, she signed. James didn't know how much he believed that. On the other hand, Shida had never questioned him when he asked her to help with his methods. She also knew a lot more about non-earthlings than he did, so maybe it was better to go with what she had to say every now and again. He shrugged and gave her a thumbs up while also saying, If you say so, just don't come crying to me when things go wrong. Shida seemed to want to answer something, but she was interrupted by a loud knock emanating from the door. Shin Kiri both lifted their heads to look towards the source of the noise, 
Shida's ears even twitching upwards. James had to shift his entire body around, shouting, Come in! in the process. The door opened, revealing the large, fuzzy shape of Moore, who looked around the room unsurely. Hey there, glad you can make it, James said, while jumping to his feet and walking over to greet her. Make yourself at home. Moore took a tentative step inside, constantly moving her head around so she could get a full picture of the room. Finally, one of her big eyes came to rest on James, who had stopped a good distance away from her so he would be right in her field of vision. Thank you for inviting me, she said in what was most likely meant to be a casual tone, although the tension in her voice was barely suppressed. James almost felt sorry for the old lady, not only because he was basically dragging her into a possibly dangerous and definitely stressful situation, but also because, with the way he had set it up, her only company for tonight would be people that were, in the best of times, irritating for her. Originally it was planned to have Pippa and Quiz along as well, seeing as they were already in the know, but the universe had other ideas, and both of them became preoccupied on short notice. But credit where credit was due, Moore had neither complained, nor shown any open disapproval of the uncomfortable situation she now found herself in. The gentle giant followed James's invitation, crossing the cabin with big steps and sitting down next to the big bed, letting out some exhausted noises in the process. Hey there, she just said to her right, having crawled over to the edge of the bed and now laying with her face right next to Moore, and James could hear the mischievousness in her voice from where he was standing. Hello, officer, Moore answered, dignified, holding her head high above Sheeda, even while sitting, and not even sparing her a glance. It's petty, officer, actually, Sheeda replied, not dropping her feigned playfulness. James shook his head. It was going to be a long day, if those two were going to keep this up. Hopefully, they would get it out of their system early on. However, seeing as the gang was all there now, it was probably time for him to start up the movie so they could get down to business. Sitting down on his desk next to where Curie was still studying tonight's entertainment system, he looked down at them and said, Sorry to interrupt, but I need my laptop now. Curie ignored him, apparently engrossed in something that the observations they made had sparked within their mind and blocking out the outside world. James snorted softly, once more shaking his head. Then he reached over to their unmoving body, past their large legs and gently but firmly grasped one of their approximation of shoulders. Not so hard that it would cause pain or restrict them in any way, but just hard enough that the pressure would be felt. The gesture had its desired effect. Just seconds after he had made contact with their exterior, movement returned to their body and awareness to their demeanour. Their red reflective eyes seemed to need a moment to take in the scene around them. James let go of them, pulling his arm back, while their gaze finally connected with his. Back with us? he asked, gently smiling at them. That is an interesting system you have there, Curie responded, sounding fairly content. Those cores are standardised, aren't they? James chuckled. Yep, they are. I know if we use them to connect all kinds of stuff with each other, he answered joyfully. However, I need to work on my laptop now, so if you would be so kind. Curie, apparently now realising the situation they were in, surprisingly looked from him to the setup and back. Oh, of course, they quickly said, scuttling backwards to make room for him. James took up position in front of the tiny computer. While he did, he noticed that Curie had come to a halt some paces behind him, standing around purposelessly and looking pretty lost as to what to do now. Thinking for a moment, he turned around and signaled him to come a bit closer with one finger. They leaned towards him, as he also brought his head closer to theirs and whispered, Looks like Moore is to wearing her assistant. Think you could help her with that? I don't want her to have to get back up. I can do that, Curie answered softly, their body swinging slightly with suppressed excitement. Giving them a last encouraging nod, James saw them scuttle away, and then turn back to the screen in front of him. He blocked out most of the ensuing conversation while he worked, focusing on not messing up his passwords, as well as correctly manoeuvring all the folders and settings, which he hadn't used for months now. He also had to think about which movie he would actually put on for today. 
even if they wouldn't be paying much attention to it, he should still choose something with a non-earthling friendly subject matter, just to be sure. He scrolled through the tiny pictures, indicating different files, until he found one that met his type criteria or what he could reasonably subject his off-world friends to. It was a fairly old flick he remembered from his childhood, weaving a story of an orphan working himself up in the world. It dealt with some heavy stuff here and there, but nothing too graphic, so it would do. He had watched it as a child, no problem, after all. Making the proper adjustments to the software running it over the projector, something yanked his attention back to reality. What I am saying is that people are afraid, and your behaviour certainly didn't help the situation. He could hear Moore say, her sophisticated tone only badly hiding the agitation in her voice. He turned his head, just in time to see Curie waddle up to him, carrying Moore's huge assistant with both hands. Thanking them with a gesture, he took it off of them and put it with the others, while his eyes wandered over to the exchange that was still going on between the two women. Oh, I'm sorry. Sheeta, who had by now sat up on the bed and apparently dropped the playful tone, responded. But somehow, making sure that people aren't afraid of me for no reason didn't exactly feel like my responsibility. This wouldn't end well, James feared. Uh, hey, Curie, James quickly said, turning towards the inventor, who looked at him attentively, seemingly unbothered by the confrontation in the room. The movie has started with this button. Want to be the one to do it when it's time? With that, he pointed at the spacebar of his keyboard. He didn't need to wait for an answer to know what they would say, so he immediately vacated the space in front of the laptop and got ready to play Arbitrator. Now you are just being dishonest and you know it, Moore countered, a voice now a bit more forceful than before. And why is that? James quickly interfered, before Sheeta had a chance to retort. On his way over, he had grabbed his desk chair so he could take a seat with them, without it seeming like he was taking either side in this, for the moment at least. Moore looked surprised about his interference. Shida, on the other hand, immediately took the opportunity, sliding over to his side and getting a good bit closer to him than she had to. She knew exactly what she was doing, and she most likely knew that it wouldn't work on James. It didn't stop her from trying, though. After having taken a moment to acclimate to James's sudden presence, Moore eventually replied to his inquiry. Well, do you not think the same people were afraid for no reason is a bit of a stretch? She is one of the galaxy's most dangerous hunters, after all. Ah, yes, James said, and, using the fact that she was already trying to play all cuddly, reached next to him to stroke Sheeta through her hair and around her ear, causing her to lean into the touch and give off soft, chuffing noises. The mighty predator. Moore looked at him disapprovingly, shaking the long fur on her neck. James was, of course, fully aware that his interactions with Sheeta were a far cry from how she treated other people on board, but they did make for a good example. Seriously though, while I understand what you mean, I think the whole death or predator thing has blown way out of proportion, he said in a more business-like manner. I mean, people literally can't tell the difference if you don't specifically tell them. Just look at me, I had to tell people for them to notice, and I look pretty much just like a meat. On the other hand of his arm, he could hear and feel Shida beginning to purr now, apparently being very pleased with him supposedly taking her side. Moore gave him her typical look of being unconvinced, which he knew so well from her by now, the eye that was directed at him narrowing slightly with her face scrunching up. You, sir, are a primate, she said in a tone that basically screamed, not angry, just disappointed, accidentally touching a nerve. Feeling the sting of the tone pierce the back of his mind, although probably not for the reasons Moore had intended, James answered maybe a bit more upset than he should have. Which is something I also have to tell people for them to know most of the time, he said firmly, the weirdness of the order of his species coming up again, fueling his irritation further. And even if I didn't, so what? People would see that me at a carnivores, big deal. The Raxas aren't treated that differently, and they are carnivores too. He just about held his voice under control, managing to sound serious but not threatening. Still, he quickly realised that he had gone off too hard and more, the old woman looking at him with a hurt confusion. Shida, who was less inclined to rethink her actions from something like that than him, apparently took this as a sign to speak up again. See? 
I told you it wasn't about me, she said insolently. Feeling that he could do some good by redirecting some of his not-so-righteous fury, he took the opportunity and grabbed a handful of Sheeta's hair with the hand he still had on her head. He wasn't pulling on it, of course, but holding it just tight enough that he was able to tug her head around a bit without hurting her. Don't think that you are getting out of this scot-free, petty officer, he said, still firmly but now a lot less serious, while Sheeta stopped purring and instead started making some half-hearted hissing sounds. Because it's not like Moore was wrong earlier. You really didn't help your situation, even if it was unfair. We both know how prickly you can be. With that, he let go of Shida, who immediately scooted away and eyed him, her ears falling backwards, upset. James ignored her pouting, and turned back to Moore, who was apparently glad that she wasn't as up against it as she thought. The giant looked at the sulking feline with a very subtle hint of satisfaction in her eyes. Although, I have to say, you certainly don't seem to be afraid of her anymore, James commented, looking back and forth between the two women. James, I may be old, but I am not a fool, Moore answered, slowly regaining her dignified tone and posture. I know by now that Sheeta will not do anything to me. And point proven. He really couldn't have said it better himself. No wanting to rub it in quite as much outwardly, as he felt like doing inwardly, James only said, See what I'm saying? All it took was some getting to know her, and you've come a long way from, She's a danger to us all. After he had said that, there was a long bout of awkward silence, not quite the reaction he had expected. Moore and Sheeta glanced at each other for a moment, and then avoided eye contact as much as they could. The realisation that those two really weren't human through and through, and not just in appearance, sank in with James, and he really didn't quite know how to break the silence. Luckily, he didn't have to, as Moore, who apparently had the most social skills out of all of them, caught a glimpse of the now covered up terminal on the wall. Say, what is going to be done about that? She asked, changing the subject and pointing a large claw over the beige cloth that had been taped over the broken glass of the screen. Thankful to have a new topic, James and Sheeta simultaneously jumped at the chance to answer, interrupting each other in the process, and their reply coming out as a garbled mess. Both of them stopped at the same time and looked at each other. They stared for just a moment before James lifted his arm to give Sheeta the right of way. Well, the thing is broken beyond repair, she said, leaning back a bit to make it easier for her to look up at Moore's face. So they're going to have to replace it, but... Since that's a whole lot of work, and not having a terminal doesn't exactly make the cabin inhospitable, they're going to wait until our next stop. The captain wasn't happy about that at all. The mention of the captain had more looking up. To what extent? she asked, and James could swear that there was a hint of concern in her voice. Sheeda let herself fall backwards onto the bed with a sigh, waving her hand at James, indicating that it was now his turn to speak. Well, of all the things there are to say about our dear captain, you can't claim that he's not creative. James asked Moore's question, scratching the back of his head while thinking about the dressing down the two of them had gotten in Uton's personal office. The subtle concern he believed to see in Moore's eye grew. To calm her down, he quickly continued. It's nothing major, really. Instead of giving us an actual punishment, he thought that this would be a good opportunity for us to help out and give back to our fellow crewmates. That's why he had us volunteer for a training exercise with the security team. An exercise about what? Moore inquired, leaning down and bringing her head closer to James's. James wasn't the one who answered, however. As Sheeda, without looking up from her line position, said, the effect of less lethal stopping weapons on high-class death welders. Basically, we'll be getting tasered and maced for the better part of a work shift, James clarified, as the significance of that statement did seem to quite sink in for more. Like I said, creative. That's barbaric, Moore exclaimed. Once she had completely comprehended what the two of them were trying to tell her, her entire body shook in her agitation, making her matted fur flay around wildly. Eh, it could have been worse, she responded nonchalantly, still looking up to the ceiling. I'm honestly just glad that it presumably won't affect Sheeta's career. It was mostly my mistake, after all, James said with a shrug. 
As he said that, Moore's gaze wandered towards the desk, where their assistants were neatly laid out next to each other, pointing at the wall. If you say so, she said, ruminative, and looked at Curie, who was still patiently waiting in front of the laptop. Well, we have held ourselves up with negativity for long enough now. Shall we get into the enjoyable part of the day now? The undertone her voice carried made James sure that she had something to say off the record. She then propped herself up on her elbows and looked over to James, who nodded and turned to Curie. Would you do the honours? He asked them, and they excitedly bobbed up and down while turning to press the space bar. With a loud fanfare, the speakers came to life as the logos of all the different studios involved in the making of the film started playing. Subtitles in galactic uniform informed non-Earthlings about the cultural context of credits and recognition in Earth filmmaking and translated any writing that was on screen. Using the minute of empty time, James beckoned Curie, saying, Come on, you sit next to me. The group formed a sort of semicircle in front of the projection, allowing them to simultaneously pay attention to the motion picture and each other. Rightmost was Curie, having taken position next to the edge of the bed and standing with their body hovering in his typical unmoving fashion. To their left, James had once again taken a seat on top of his bed, sitting cross-legged and turning more towards the group than towards the movie. Shida had taken position towards the middle of the mattress, laying on her side and resting her head on one hand. Finally, Moore had half laid down on the ground on the leftmost side, resting only her upper body over the bed, with her legs stretched towards the wall. Now, to the real reason why we're all here, James signed, as the opening credits faded out and the first scene started to play. Now that we can finally discuss things semi-openly, we can actually plan what to do next. I have some ideas I would like to outline first if that is okay with you. General gestures of agreement followed, allowing James to continue with all eyes attentively on him. Thank you. All right, so we managed to ensure that the people behind the scenes aren't getting any more intel on us if we don't let them. He started out, gesturing towards the destroyed terminal. Our biggest advantage right now is, presumably, that they haven't yet caught on to us knowing about them. Admittedly, that isn't much, but it is something we can work with. He paused for a moment, scanning the faces of his partners in crime for anything they might have to add so far. As there appeared to be nothing, he continued. Having cut their flow of information as best as we can, the next step for us should be establishing one of our own. We need to know what exactly we are up against and why. Sounds good, now how do we do that? She had commented with her free hand. This was where things got complicated. It depends, James answered and turned his attention towards Curie, making sure they knew they were directly being addressed now. Curie, do you think you could take us some sort of surveillance device? You know, like the one they were trying to use on me? For a moment, he wasn't quite sure if they had paid attention, as their unmoving face gave absolutely no indication of whether or not they had understood him. Then their bodies suddenly burst into motion, their forward hands executing the signs and gestures with such precision and speed that James, in his surprise, had some trouble keeping up. If I can get some materials, that should be possible. A camera and microphone sending data are no problem, but I would have to figure out an ideal frequency that doesn't interfere with anything else on the ship, and is ideally hard to detect. Also, a design that could be hidden easily, while also retaining its effectiveness. It shouldn't be as unwieldy as the one they used. They quickly listed off. If we need it soon, I could try taking some inspiration from Earth technology, and use some standardised parts. To guarantee maximum effectiveness of the surveillance, we will also need a receiver, that cannot only display and save large amounts of data, but is also capable of decoding, since it will be much easier if communication between the device and its receiver happens completely encrypted. Everyone stared at them, even James. Apparently, contrary to his belief, he didn't need to specify anything that a device like that would need in order to work for his plan. Shida looked like she couldn't believe what she had just seen, while more just seemed lost. Getting back his bearings, James signed, I believe I can help with that last part and pointed at the computer, currently playing their distraction. Will that do? That should meet the requirements, Curry answered, seeming like they were trailing off a bit. Nodding, James turned back towards the others, leaving Curry to do their figuring out. 
Shida, now that you've met him personally, anything you can tell me about Reprieg? He asked the still unbelieving looking officer. She shook her head, making her wild hair rustle, and sat up so she could use both hands to sign. Well, he is an officer. At least his identifier says he is, but I don't remember ever seeing him at roll call, or at all for that matter, she reported, passingly. Which also means he is new to the ship, otherwise I would definitely have met him at some point. And do you think you can subtly find out some more about him? James challenged her with a smile. Shido grinned at that, which on her face still looked more like a sneer than anything else. With the way he's been blundering around the place? She responded dismissingly, and let her tongue glide over her sharp teeth. Chow's play. James shook his head and chuckled. This was going well so far. Now he had to think about what best to discuss next. But it's also interrupted as Moore tenderly raised an arm, indication that she wished to say something. Knowing that she had probably been sitting on that since before his explanations, he gestured for her to speak her mind. She nodded her enormous head and raised her arms, to explain what it was that weighed in her mind. I can see that you are all very serious about this, she began slowly. And I know that you have most likely put more thought in it than I have, and should it be needed I will absolutely support you in this, but I still cannot help but feel like you are blowing something out of proportion. Shida annoyingly smacked her lips and piped in. You are right, we are serious about this, she said, her arms moving forcefully with each gesture, her face an upset visage. And we're risking a lot with every step we take, but if you aren't convinced that this needs to be done, then nobody is asking you to be here. Actually, I am, James interjected, immediately shutting that notion down. He understood Sheeta's frustration about being doubted in this, especially since she was probably the one who stood to lose the most in their situation, but he still couldn't let that slide. He looked at Sheeta consolatorily, trying to convey that he understood her, and signed, Don't worry, I'll talk to her. Sheeta, while probably still not agreeing, at least didn't seem to want to argue with him, and instead turned her attention away from him and towards the movie. For now, James couldn't expect more than that, and thankfully turned towards Moore. Sorry about that, he signed with an excusatory smile. Please, explain what you meant. Moore took a deep breath before she answered, and straightened herself up a bit. Shida is not wrong. I know that you are risking a lot with the things you are doing, she expressed, her motions fluid and consistent. She is especially. Just look at your situation. You two have already gotten yourselves into trouble. She paused and looked James in the eyes for a moment. He nodded, understandingly, and gestured for her to continue. It is because you are risking so much that I feel like I have to worry. It just does not feel right to me, putting so much on the line without proper cause. The old lady continued, and now the weight of her years seemed to be visible in each gesture. I will not deny that the happenings around you are strange, and need clearing up, but I cannot say that I feel that the lengths you are going to are justified. You also have to think about your future, not just of the now. To James, it almost felt like she was addressing someone else with her speech, just as much as she was him and Shida. He could clearly tell that her intentions were as pure as they were misguided. He now also realised that some lessons were probably learned at very different ages on worlds that weren't as hostile as his own. With steady hands, he started to form his answer. More, I know what is on the line here, he said. Other than you, I'm just over two uniform years old, yet to be on this ship, I have spent more than one of those two in school. Right after that, I spent a fourth of the other one in military service, and then another half is studying. My entire life's work boils down to me being here right now. He made sure to give emphasis to that, leaving no doubt how serious of a statement that was for him. Moore looked at him, shaken. Military service? She asked, her wide eye aimed squarely at him. James waved that part off. A condition my mother gave me so that she would allow me to study, he explained quickly. But that's not the point. The point is I know exactly what I have to lose, and the same goes with Shida. He made serious eye contact with Moore. To her credit, she didn't even seem to tense up under it by now. 
If you have worked this hard to be where you are, even at your young age, she slowly questioned him, then why are you risking it all for this? As he answered that, James made sure that every single one of his moves was unmistakable and certain. I don't really care if I'm being spied on. That alone wouldn't bother me. I can look out for myself, he related. But somebody tried to kill Curie. Or if they didn't, they at least didn't care if they would die in that explosion. And even if I didn't have to fear that I could very well be the next on their list, with someone being constantly on my tail, I can hardly sit by and watch as they either try it again, or go for whoever is next on the chopping block. He took a calming breath and stroked through his overgrown hair, trying to keep her collected demeanour while signing. This is my life's work, my dream. To be out here and try to make life better for everyone with my research. But how could I claim to do that if I sat by and did nothing, while something like this is going on right under my nose? He resumed his speech. And I don't know what Cheetah's reasons are, but if she wasn't at least as convinced of them as I am, she wouldn't be here right now. Lastly, he added, and while I still would like to ask you to be here with us, if you can't find it within yourself that trust us in this, then I will certainly not force you to stay. There was a lot more pompous than he liked to admit to himself. He could only imagine the kind of ridicule a speech like that would have gotten him back on Earth, or even from Shida, how she paid attention. But he felt like this may be the best way to talk to the elderly lady. Moore seemed to be at a loss for words for a moment. James, I... She started to sign, but stopped there. Suddenly, something ripped through the white noise of the movie. Wow, those two sure are going at it, she had commented out loud, making both James and Moore look at her in disbelief. She appeared to still be focused on the projection in front of them, so James also took a look forward to see what she was on about. Oh my, Moore said, also out loud, as James felt a wave of embarrassment wash over him. Carly on screen was quite a graphic erotic scene between the lead and his movie boss, who was presented as a ruthless career woman. Oh no, I completely forgot about that scene, he said, hiding his face in his hand. Had he really seen this as a kid? If so, he had successfully blocked that memory out. The only one not commenting further on that scene was Curie, who seemed to view it with a more clinical sense of curiosity than usual. The conversation, and with it the entire meeting, was pretty much completely derailed at this point, with James now having to explain quite a bit of context about Earth Entertainment. The serious tone that had filled the room earlier was immediately all but forgotten. From that point onward, he started to actually watch the rest of the movie, with James filling in some blanks whenever they came up. And even after it was over, a discussion about it continued, with James pointing out a lot of things that were inconsistent with how life on Earth actually worked, in difference to what was portrayed in the film, while the others commented on either the craziness or the convenience of it all. Apparently they would have to do some action movie nights in the future, without the distractions. As he was just explaining why it was generally seen as immoral on Earth to use sex as a way to progress your career to Shida, a new noise was introduced to the room. A loud beeping emanated from James's desk. One of their assistants was ringing. A quick inspection showed that it was, in fact, his own. Confusedly, he shushed the conversation for a moment and picked up. Is this Alwyn? A voice asked, unsurely from the speakers. Uh, James Alwyn speaking, yes. Uh, what can I do for you? He answered. We have a communication request for you. The voice continued, sounding almost dumbfounded. Someone who claims to be your sister? 